Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to another episode of Extra Time Meet the Team, episode number five right here on FA Euro TV in conjunction with the Eastern Observer and the Blackjack Media Group. I'm Joey Jerzink. I cannot thank you all enough for joining us. And alongside me here is six foot forward in a brand new reserve role, but also for FA Euro New York as a whole, director of youth football operations and the 2007 head coach for the club, Adam Marku. Adam, thank you so much for joining me here on this gorgeous afternoon. Thanks, so. Yeah, no, it is. I, if, if there's a helicopter in the background, sorry about that. They come by from time to time. Uh, but uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so, on. yeah, for sure, absolutely. We are extremely grateful to have you on on this gorgeous afternoon. And, uh, and again, we hope that for those that are watching, uh, we do hope that you do subscribe to all of the FA Euro social media channels, uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, all of the above there. Uh, let's get into this. We have gone through all four uh, episodes thus far. Uh, we've done uh, we've done Stone Strong and we've done DeAndre Gordon. We've done Cesare Marconi as well as Anto Santos. And now Adam Marku becomes number five on the totem pole. Let's get to this, ladies and gentlemen. Now, and uh, Adam, you you have been a part of the FA Euro family for as long as I've known you, as you know, for roughly about six years and way beyond. Talk about how FA Euro became a part of the family for you. Well, it, it started probably while I was in college, which was uh, ancient history. But uh, <laughs> is uh, I, I think I got a call from Joe uh, Balsamo when I was uh, a senior in college. So in 2013, um, might have been 2012, but uh, maybe the year before. Just saying that he, he, had, he wanted to put uh, a club together for youth. Um, that he was starting something and asking if I wanted to be involved. Um, and I'd known Joe for a long time. He coached me when I was young. Um, and I've al I'd always stayed in touch with him. He coached the, uh, what was then PDL, uh, but is now USL League Two uh, for Brooklyn Knights. Um, and I had gotten to play for him there. So uh, we had a, a long standing relationship and I just knew him incredibly well. And so when he called, I was really willing to just do anything at that point. I thought it was you know, the opportunity to work with him directly and get some exposure to coaching and seeing youth soccer was just uh, kind of an incredible opportunity for me. Um, so that's where it all started. And uh, Joe will tell a story, I think, that starts basically on a car ride on a trip in Tampa where we had like six or seven people in the car. We were going down to basically crash the, the USL, but then PDL convention uh, to see if we could get a franchise um, with no real expectation of getting it um and we're driving in the car and suddenly uh we get the phone call from from the usl uh the head of the usl it was tim holt saying we did in fact get the franchise and to to be there at the convention and uh, we pulled off the road we were uh honking the horn uh slamming the the roof of the car and um it was just one of those moments that i, I will never forget i think no one in that uh car will ever forget um, and that was very much the start of the whole thing. Uh, and once we had that franchise, it, it gave me the opportunity to play for the club as well. So it was really, uh, it was really a kind of uh, full, full-bodied experience. I was, I was, uh, I was new to coaching at the time, and so it was, it was really a, a first step, but a, a trial by fire, and one that uh, that I was really lucky to get the opportunity to do. So it's been all, all forward from there. And you bring up the coaching part as well as the playing part. We'll get to that later on in our in our episode here. But the coaching part for you, you have worked your way up to become the director of youth operations as well as the 2007 head coach. Uh, we have seen multiple coaches either come and go, but you and your twin brother, Ben, uh, who we will have on uh, in the future on Extra Time Meet the Team. Uh, but for you, you have been... Uh, fluctuating when it comes to the 2005 uh, head coach to 2007 head coach. And now what we're seeing in, in that is, is, you know, you're, you're so trustworthy in the Balsamo family that you are really given the reins to coach all of these different youngsters at the different levels. Talk about that and really how, um, you know, how not only the trust, but just how good it feels to be, uh, able to coach all of these different levels of players. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the first point is right. Uh, I mean, the trust is definitely a two-way street. Um, Joe and Marco, um, Vincent now, who 
I first met Vincent when he was like a very, very little kid. Um, and now he's coaching at the club. Uh, but the trust is, is incredible and it, it enables us to rely on one another. And, uh, and I, I think that's kind of the foundation of everything. In terms of the different teams, it's actually, I, I'm starting to, to feel obviously my age, but uh, <laughs> Alan Poneman, who is in the USL team, uh, USL2, I coached when he was maybe 13 or 14 years old. I didn't coach him for a long time. There was another coach at the time, and I was I was sort of just filling in. Um, but to see players that have worked with us and who we've developed, and now they're coming in the team and trying to take my job, it, it's actually the best feeling in the world. I mean, I say it in a kind of a jokey way, but it really is. Um, and to see the development of players over time. So getting to work with different age groups and see the di different developmental stages and where a player is when he's young uh, or she's young and then moving forward in their career. Um, it really is an, an amazing experience. It, it makes me think back to growing up and playing soccer here in New York. And um, it's something that I think I wish I, I had a little more guidance. Um, soccer was a little different in this country at the time. Uh, but to see the kids now doing it and the steps that they take and the strides that they make on a consistent basis, if you look away from them for six months, you come back and you see a completely new player. So uh, it's great to get to coach them, but more so it's great to just watch their development. Uh, they're very much in charge of their own, uh, their own progress. And when you see that, you realize you've probably done something all right as a coach um, and not gotten in their way, which is, I think, the, you know, the, the worst thing that you can do. So yeah, it's a blast. It's fantastic. And it, and, especially uh, going back to kind of the roots of this coming out of college and only having coached for a short amount of time and the trust of Joe to say, listen, here's a, here's an age group and go work with them. And then just to give me advice and feedback throughout and to help me with coaching education, all of that stuff was, uh, was invaluable to my own coaching career, which I didn't even think of as a career at the time. So it, it really is uh, you know, a testament to the trust that he had in me. And hopefully over time I can, uh, I can repay that. Um, you know, in stages. Both your brother and yourself went to Packer uh, down in Brooklyn. And for those that know, Packer is right actually behind where I work at St. Francis College right now. Uh, and in Brooklyn, I can hear you I... shouting actually sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, over there. I mean, hey, listen. When if you if, if you ever return back there, I mean, listen, not not for long because they are moving next year. But uh, we'll see what happens there. Next time you come back, I'll make sure I'm there and you hear my voice. <laughs> uh, but talk about the start for you in terms of the game of soccer for you, and really, you just brought up earlier how you really did not see coaching as really the avenue for you to go down. And both you and your brother have taken a little bit of a you know of a different career path in terms of soccer um, and where obviously you are right now in your day jobs is not soccer but for you to be able to to still play on a consistent basis to be able to coach on a on a daily basis and talk about really the the roots of your soccer beginning and how it all began for you uh, even as, even as a youth and what and also what your aspirations were uh, down the road yeah, it was interesting. I kind of stumbled into soccer. Um, both my parents uh, didn't play. Uh, they didn't really know anything about the game. They're now huge fans as a result of, I think, my childhood and, and uh, kind of falling in love with the game. In fact, I get messages uh, more often from my mom, but also from my dad sometimes saying, you know, there's a game on at 3.30 today. Are you going to be watching? And um, so they're super into it. They're into the English Premier League and uh, the Champions League. Um, and they sometimes know more than I do about uh, teams and players. So uh, it's become a family thing, but it didn't quite start. Ladies and gentlemen, we do welcome you back to Extra Time Meet the Team right here on FA Euro TV, as well as the Eastern Observer and the Blackjack Media Group alongside Adam Mark, who I'm Joey Jozinka. Cannot thank you all enough for staying with us here throughout all of the technical issues that we are experiencing right now. But Adam Mark, who is now inside his building, and now hopefully we've got a little bit more uh, – a more, uh, you know, a more consistent Wi-Fi signal on his end and even on my end as well. But uh, cannot thank you all enough for coming back, Adam. Same thing with you as well. Thank you, sir, for going inside and uh, continuing our little chat. And uh, we we just left off right where you were discussing about the Olympic Development Program. Let's uh, continue with that conversation. Sure. Yeah. No. And and I just wanted to give you a chance to do the introduction again. 
Um, so I think it came off really clean that time. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so sorry about that. And sorry to your viewers. Um, so yeah, no Olympic development program. I think what was happening with soccer at the t- that time in my life was it was not only something that I was doing and spending time on because I had other interests, um, but it was giving me opportunities and it was making me feel like if I worked hard, I could achieve something and it could create a path forward for me. So that was the first time in my life that I sort of made that connection to something happening now to a, a potential that it could uh, could have the place in my life in the future. Um, and so that meant something to me. And so I really wanted to continue. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was very lucky to work with some very good coaches in, in New York, um, which is not a common experience at the time when I was growing up. Um, it was rare, I would say, to have one good coach. And I had a, a series of them starting with Joe and then moving on to some others. So um, it really was a, a, a lucky educational experience for me. <clears throat> and I don't really put it down to anything but luck. Um, I, I think also uh, the organization I was playing for did a good job recruiting coaches and, and getting people in. But most of the coaches I've had are now either D1 coaches at, at schools, LIU and um, at uh, Fordham uh, or coaching in the MLS uh, like Gio Sabarisi is. So, you know, it, it, it really is a, a who's who of incredible coaches. That was kind of just before their major breakthrough, I guess. And, and so I was I was just lucky. Um, and so kind of moving forward with the game, um, I never thought that I was going to be a coach. I, I, when I was um, 17, 18, getting ready to go to college, I had no, I, I would say no interest, but it, it really wasn't no interest. It was just no thought of becoming a coach. Um, and it wasn't until my first off season in college where I realized my kind of consumption of the game wasn't as much as, as what it had been in the past. Um, and I wanted to do something. So uh, I basically reached out to a local club, didn't know anything about them. Um, and uh, two, two folks, Zach Edinger and, and Jeremy Wilson, whose names I note because they should know that they had a big influence on my uh, development as, as coaches. And I think they do know, but um, they deserve the shout out. Um, just took me in and gave me a team of, of like five-year-olds. I want to say you five. Um, I had never coached before. I didn't know what I was doing. I came the first day with a complicated lesson plan, basically, um, and then realized it was toddlers. And my main goal was to keep them on their feet. Um, but that was my introduction into coaching. And it kind of just, uh, you know, went forward from there. And uh, it's been one thing after the, after another with more opportunities presenting themselves. And, and so it's just kind of one of those things where as long as things continue to present themselves and there's forward trajectory and momentum, um, you know, I, I got hooked and it, it's going to be difficult to give it up. Here you go, five-year-olds. Follow the X's and the O's and make sure you run in zigzags. What's a zigzag, Coach Adam? I have no idea. Uh, the best part there, though, is, is that to be able to coach these youngsters, how much patience does it take, especially when you know the game in and out and, you you know, really on the back of your hand, you're able to do this, to do this, to do this but to teach these young kids how to even just dribble and to make a through ball or even a pass or anything along those lines. How difficult was that for you to start out early on? It was absolutely impossible. <laughs> I, I, it was absolutely impossible to, to understand the level of patience that uh, you need. You really have to be a parent of multiple children, I think, um, which I was not. And, uh, and then beyond that, just understanding <laughs> how when you've done something for a long time and it's become habit and second nature and muscle memory to then break it down for someone who's never done it before. That was, uh, that was a, a kind of shocking experience for me. I had no idea how to, other than just demoing over and over again, how to get through to, to young kids. Um, it's something that I continue to work on. And uh, I think all good coaches continue to work on that, uh, yeah. communicating and working with different ages and being able to describe what's going on. Um, but yeah, it was really, really difficult. Um, and it remains difficult to this day, but I think you get more confident in yourself and you get uh, some techniques that you know work um, and that are go-tos. And then you kind of roll with the punches and see what this group of kids that you're working with, uh, what really impacts them versus what doesn't. And so monitoring their responses to your inputs is important uh, to see what happens. And then to your, your final point, I think about being able to kind of know the game and the kids don't necessarily know the game yet. Of course they don't know the game yet. I don't know the whole game, 
and I'm, I've been involved with it for a long time. So um, especially at the younger ages, it's very difficult not to sort of call out every action ahead of time. The game develops so slowly for an adult. When you watch young kids play, right. you want to say almost like you're uh, handling a video game controller. Now pass it here. Now kick it there. Now shoot. Right. Um, and you just have to try not to. I mean, training is really your time with the kids and to express yourself and help them improve. And then you have to give them responsibility in games and let them win or lose or whatever it is based off their own ideas and their own understanding. So that was the other part of it that was really difficult for me at first. And, yeah. um, and so I had to kind of shut myself up and push the mute button and figure out that let the kids learn from the game. And um, that was something also that, that was uh, new to me at the time. Um, so yeah, it was those, those combination of things in the early going made me think about whether I really wanted to do coaching because it's a little different than when you watch like a professional manager managing like a, a, a major team and they're shouting out instructions and they're doing post game, you know, press conferences and these are the tactics and there's pundits talking about it. You know, this is very much when you're working with kids development focused and you're thinking about the long term and you're kind of their servant. Um, and so this is like the, uh, this is, th that was a real shift, a mindset shift that I had to have early on. And it helped working at the club that I was working at uh, when I was in college and then coming here and learning from Joe and taking his experience. And, you know, all of those things add up and you start to feel like, well, all right, maybe I'm not terrible. Maybe I can kind of pursue this and see where it goes. So that, that's where that started. And yeah, it was difficult. It was very difficult. Yeah, not only say not only difficult, but the cool thing, obviously, being able to come back uh, and and working with a coach that you've known for so many years here at FA Euro uh, to be able to get that opportunity working with the 2005s, the 2007s, and then eventually, as we brought up at being elevated to the director of youth operations, where you oversee the entire the, the entire thing with obviously uh, with the observation of the of Joe and Marco and, and, and the rest of the club. But uh, to be able to see this and then to you know be able to see the development of these of these young kids. Uh, how good does it feel for you when you know when they eventually move up and then even when you're when you get shifted over from as we brought up earlier uh, off camera last year you were a 2005 head coach this year you're 2007 and and you know on top of overseeing the entire the entire thing with your brother uh, how difficult is it you know when you get moved over and I almost compare it to like a teacher in a school because coaches and teachers are essentially the same thing just, one coach, you know, one, one teaches sports and the other one teaches real life. So for you, how difficult is that when you see these kids eventually move up similar to what you brought up about Alan Ponyman earlier, or now he's not even one of your players anymore. He's, he's your teammate. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. It, it's difficult for the first month when you have a relationship with the parents and the players, especially, um, and you you try so hard not to backseat or uh, drive the, you know, whoever the, the other right. coach is, because you're always communicating with whoever the new coach is to say, you know, this was my experience when you work with this player, keep that in mind. So there's a constant communication, um, but there's also uh, the value of changing teams and changing voices who's going into, who's, who's essentially when you trust your coaching staff and everyone is giving the same message, but just maybe in a slightly different way it's so helpful for players because they have the sense that yes, there's a ton of consistent information that I know is going to be right because it's verified by multiple sources, by multiple coaches, but there's a different slant that everyone sees the game with naturally. And so to get that information in a slightly different way could be hugely impactful for one kid. Um, equally to have the evaluator be somebody different is uh, incredibly impactful for both kids in both directions. You can have someone who, you know, I do it with my kids, someone I'm just used to playing all the time. I get used to putting them in the first 11 and maybe they need to be reevaluated. Equally, somebody who's struggling um, or needs a change in scenery or something to, to change in order to get the most out of themselves gets the opportunity to step up and step into that role. Um, and that's not to say any kid is better or worse than anyone else. It's just the, the circumstance breeds this opportunity for kids. And so to be able to kind of change that circumstance and allow um, for new voices to be heard. Joe actually has a great saying that sometimes uh, the more you cook the egg, the harder it gets. So you don't want to just continue boiling forever. Um, 
you, you need to have some sort of change. And so, yes, the first month is difficult from a, uh, the standpoint of just being close to your players and having the bond. But then you regain that bond with the next group. And you, I trust all of our coaches to, to carry on the work I'm doing and, and then to push the kids forward. So, you know, it's much easier than when we started where there were a couple of coaches and we were, you know, more of a kind of local club. Um, I, I w- would have a harder time handing my team off to somebody else. I mean, it's not my team. It's just the team that I'm working with. Um, but now because we have such a uh, developed structure and there's a developmental pathway through the club and the coaches understand what's going on and we have consistent coaching education, it's very easy. Um, aside from that month of anguish uh, where you're watching every single training session game and being like, well, I would have done or whatever. Um, beyond that, it, it's, it's, uh, we know it's in the best interest for the kids. Um, that's absolutely consistent with what's happening across the world. So um, it makes me feel good and it reinforces my belief that it's right to be a part of that larger soccer um, uh, experience for the kids and also community of knowing other clubs in, in, in uh, other countries are operating in this way, um, that it's the right thing to do. So at the end of the day, it's absolutely right. Um, and it's rewarding to get to work with different groups of kids and, and see them in different stages of development. Now, how difficult was it, especially when you're not developing these kids for nearly six months because of COVID-19, how difficult was it for you to not be able to work with these kids in person? And what was it like for you as a head coach to work with them virtually? How different and difficult was that for you to come up with something in a matter of like just weeks or days or whatnot, or even in a couple of months where these kids now have to completely take their outside vision and put it now inside in front of a computer, just like how you and I are doing here. And really the activity level has gone from here all the way down to here, but you want to try and keep it here as a coach. How tough for you? How tough was it for you to be able to do that with a young, with a young child's mentality? Yeah. You know, it was incredibly difficult. I think everybody in the world who was, who was working, uh, in a social environment found that difficult and, and adjusting was um, forced upon us. And I think necessity is the mother of invention in that, in that sense. Um, the most difficult realization was probably a week into it uh, when everything had shut down in March of 2020. And we realized this was going to be a long lasting thing, or at least I realized it was going to be um, understanding that the kids are going to lose some amount of time in their development here, no matter what we do, no matter how well we try to do the virtual stuff, they're going to lose uh, some time. And when it comes to their day, you know, when, when they're in the USL or they're in college and they're getting the opportunity to go pro, no one is going to care with all due respect to the situation, whether they miss six months because of COVID or they miss six months because they went away. Right. So that was the most difficult realization. And that was the motivation really to say, we have to do as much as we possibly can. Um, and I give huge credit to Marco Balsamo um, for setting up the uh, technological interfaces that we were using um, as quickly as he did. Um, we started a virtual training center on the website that was up you know, almost instantly. Uh, we had Training was basically, it went from a, a three day a week thing to a six day a week thing where every day we would send a video to the players, a technical video to work on. Depending on their age, the video was slightly different. And then they would send back a video of themselves doing it. And then coaches would then send them back comments right. and feedback. And it made training, um, it was much more technical based, which allowed for some technical improvement. Um, it was obviously individual based and space limited and all of that. Um, but it made training a daily thing. And some of the kids have actually carried that forward now where they might not have before COVID trained outside of our training sessions or worked on something on their own time. And now they're seeing the value of doing it and the ability to benefit from it. So um, it was trying for us, just like it was for anybody, uh, but we were lucky. We had the tools in place to, to kind of deal with it, which was great. And then our coaches were above and beyond. I mean, this is like getting a, a video from, from, 25 kids a day um, that's six or seven minutes long and then giving feedback on the whole thing to every kid. That's like grading, you know, exams every single day. Right. And our coaches did it for nine months or 10 months or whatever it was until we could be phase one back in person and separated, but then phase two back in person and together. 
limited numbers, small groups, and moving forward just based on the protocols we were getting from New York and from uh, U.S. soccer. And um, I think it's just a credit to how passionate our coaching staff is. They didn't get paid more. Um, you know, I uh, the 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 environment was such that they could have very easily said, and a lot of clubs did, you know what, we're just going to furlough the coaches and we're going to kind of hang them out to dry. And at the same time, we're not going to expect them to do anything with the kids. Um, and it wasn't our approach and it was never even considered. And that was, you know, I think that's just a testament to the passion that's going on here. So, um, yeah, we learned a lot about ourselves and the kids have taken good habits out of it because like I said, some of them were not training every day. They were just training when we had training sessions and yeah. now they've taken those, uh, those ideas of technical training from the videos and they've just applied it to our current situation, which is maybe we train together three times a week and have a game. Uh, and they're also working on something on their own uh, the other nights the, or the other days when, when we don't have training. Yeah, really unbelievable stuff when, you know, for, for a pandemic that has, we have not seen a pandemic before last year for nearly 100 years. And for all of us, we've never been around for that. So we have no idea what we're doing, especially in the sports world where our main focus is not really about soccer or really about sports or anything along those lines because we need to make sure that our health and safety comes first. But with that being said, two years later, nearly 720 days later, the USL League Two club is back. Uh, and they're in business as well, right sitting now, right now sitting at a 2-3-1 and one record with seven points. Just a couple of years ago, that was their most points uh, in, in PDL as well as the first year of USL League Two play. Seven points through five games here thus far. Adam, a little bit of a different approach here. Uh, from from really the club and 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 the the competition getting a little bit better and seeing seven points in the first week of June, that's something that we have we're not really used to seeing uh, with this club. Talk about what you've seen as well as the goal you scored, which turned out to be the game winning goal uh, just a couple of days ago on Saturday night against Westchester Flames. Sure. Well, so to start with the first piece, I mean, I think. Um, the trajectory of the USL is pushing the trajectory of the rest of the club. Um, you know, that, that is kind of the, uh, that is the first team. That's what people are most exposed to from the outside of the club. So um, to have success in that is, I think, helping to drive the youth as well. Um, but I mean, the team is just better than it's been in past years. And it's been, it, you know, great credit to uh, Nico Baudo for doing an incredible job. Uh, bringing in players through his program and that he's aware of from abroad. Um, same, obviously, to Joe and Marco, as always, um, and to our other coaches uh, on the staff who worked really hard with that. Um, this was probably the earliest that we've gotten our full team together uh, in any of the years to start training before the season. Um, and there are some exceptions, uh, of course, because the NCAA season went on longer than it typically does. Uh, but for the most part, the team was together a week and a half, at least two weeks before the season, that's enough time for at least a fast forwarded preseason to get to know everybody and come together. And so, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the results and I, I don't actually have the results off the top of my head, but I think each of the games that we've lost, I think were by a goal. Um, and so, you know, we are really in a situation where seven points is at this point in the season, the best that we've ever been. Equally, we could be disappointed not to have done slightly better at this point. So um, the mentality of the team, the togetherness, the training, which is every day and everybody is always there, uh, that's new. And so it's been an incredible uh, transition to see that happening. Uh, and I, I think you can tell kind of in the, the atmosphere as well with the players that they just feel as though this is a team that should be competing to be in the playoffs and to get uh, to whatever the next level is in this in this league. Uh, whereas in the past, it, it at times uh, felt more like a place to house people for the summer and give them a chance to stay sharp for their uh, for their college season. So there's kind of been a mentality shift there. So that was on, on that side of things. And then on the goal side of things, you know, this is like a, this has been such a working man's team, I think, so far this season. Uh, Christian has a couple of goals. He's been great since he's, he's come in. Um, Filippo has a goal. Cesare has a goal. Um, and so the, every, uh, DeAndre has a couple of goals, but no one has 10 goals and, and the remainder of the team zero. So it's really been where one person kind of uh, opens the door. Someone else comes in and tries to uh, 
tries to make the most of the opportunity and help the team out. And so that, that was really all I was doing on, uh, on Wednesday night. Um, or when was it Sunday night? I forget which game this was, but yeah. Saturday night. night yes. Yeah. Saturday night. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just that kind of thing. You come in, you try to make an impact. Um, and, uh, you know, coming off the bench is something that, uh, well, thankfully I, I suppose in my career, I haven't done an incredible amount of, and, um, but it does give you a chance to observe the opponent. It gives you a chance to observe tra- trends in the game. Um, and then you come in and you, you, you try to score. So that goal was a great pass from Cesare, uh, from Cesare, from uh, Christian. Yes. Um, and it, it gave me, uh, after not what probably was not the greatest first touch, the opportunity to get a shot away. And um, I just tried to hit the corner and keep it low and give the goalkeeper something to do. Um, and, and it crept in. So it was, uh, it was, it was that kind of a goal that, that I think was not atypical of, uh, of uh, you know, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a stunner. It was just enough to get the team the victory, and I was glad to help with that uh, on Saturday. You brought up earlier uh, with, the, with, with the mumbled question that I had earlier uh, in terms of the losses that you had brought up, uh, 1-0 to Long Island Rough Riders, 1-0 to Morris Elite SC, and 3-2 loss to Manhattan Soccer Club uh, last Wednesday. So exactly what you said, the three losses have all come uh, by a one-goal margin. Uh, And then obviously the tie against upcoming opponent FC Motown, which was a home game at Central Park, uh, Morris Plains, New Jersey. We'll be, uh, FA Euro will be facing them on Wednesday the 9th, uh, starting at 7 p.m. from Drew University. Adam, let's keep moving forward here. 2007s, uh, you, right after your goal and right after the game was done, you had scored the game-winning goal we had just brought up. There was a celebration uh, from there. All of your players were in. Were, were right near you, jumping around. You got the victory. We were playing some good music. Seven points now there. Uh, talk about how cool it was for the 2007s, not only to be there, but also to really be hugging you and just celebrating with their head coach. Yeah, it was incredible. And we could hear them during the game. This was the first, I want to say, real home game that we had because we had, the first home game was over Memorial Day weekend. It poured. Um, and so, you know, there were folks that were away or, the you know, the rain kept them out. So uh, we, we hadn't really played a home game yet. And uh, this was the first one. And I think it was it was obvious to our players um, that, you know, how much it, it means to, to the kids and and to be able to hear their support, um, that was incredible. That was a topic of discussion after the game, actually. So, um, you know, it was one of those things that was just fantastic. And I think back to being a kid and growing up in uh, a club called Brooklyn Knights, Joe at the time, Joe Balsamo was coaching their PDL team, which became the USL. Um, and I went to all of those games. And I just remember what it felt like to, to sit and watch I'm not sure if I ever had a coach playing. I don't think so. But there were people that I did at least meet and know that were playing. And it was, uh, it was, it was special for me as a, as a kid. And I think it's special for our kids, too, because it gives them the chance not only to see their coach playing um, and, you know, get a chance to put his money where his mouth is, I suppose. Um, and I, I've gotten my fair share of, uh, of feedback from my players. So um, it's a two-way street. But uh, – in any case, no, it, it's it's uh, an opportunity for the kids not only to see their coach play, but also to see players who are in the USL Academy team getting the opportunity. Justin played, uh, Mohammed played, um, and others have played throughout the season. And with the 2007s, okay, maybe that's a couple of years away, but certainly with my 2005 group from last year, that's right around the corner. So to see how quickly things will change from them to from youth soccer in quotes to adult soccer professional kind of level. Um, I think that's it, that in and of itself, whether they know it or not, is an exposure that's great for them to have. But yeah, after the game was just joyful. That was just exciting. And to get to see all my kids out there and uh, jumping around, I, uh, I was a little worried they were going to tackle me when they came out, but uh, they were gentle enough. So no, it was a great experience. It was awesome. It was really cool. And again, to see that it really is, you know, phenomenal. And you brought up about how your 2005s, they're right around the corner. Adam, we are old, okay? We're getting yeah. older. And this is just, it's really unbelievable how you bring up 2005. I, I saw the last pandemic, actually, Joey. 
<laughs> wow. Well then, all right. Well then, I don't know how much longer you're going to be around to right, see right, uh, right. To, to to see these 2005s. Uh, <laughs> but listen, in all, all joking aside, though, really amazing stuff here, Adam. Let's conclude with this. Um, you now obviously are in the reserve role. A few years ago, you would be a consistent starter. Uh, with USL League Two and on the first team, but now again, as we've brought well, as we've brought up, uh, you've logged roughly about 35 minutes of of game time on the pitch uh, this season so far, and you've been really backing up the forward Filippo Begliardi. Uh, what we have seen from you in a different reserve role and really a leadership role, and using your coaching knowledge on the bench towards these younger players who are really not a part of the whole, you know, of really the FA Euro family uh, all the way from, or, or their their roots are not a part of FA Euro. And to see what you have done here uh, or what, you know, you can really share to those, to those that are next to you on the bench, what is it for you uh, or what does it feel like for you to kind of take that reserve role, you know, as you're getting older uh, when you've really been a consistent player on the first team? Uh, less tiring. It's less tiring. <laughs> um, it's just a different, it's just, it, it's kind of like, you know, looking at the same picture just from a slightly different vantage point. Um, so much of it is familiar and then so much of it is slightly different. Um, and it's just a matter of uh, kind of accepting, you know, whatever role I can, I can benefit the team in. So, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm looking for as many minutes as I possibly can get just like everybody else. But if I can uh, be a help and, I think I get that. Um, I, I get the advantage of having the kind of automatic trust of of the younger players from just being an older player and having been in the league, and they can come to me with questions. And I think so. I hope that it, it gives me more of kind of a podium and a, a, a mouthpiece to be able to to provide guidance and feedback. And I don't expect them to listen to me. I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't have listened to me if this was <laughs> six or seven years ago, but. You know, we can only try. So um, I think I think that it's like like you said, it, it's something slightly different, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying helping the team. I'm enjoying where we are in the season. Um, so, you know, if this is working, let's not let's not do too, too much to uh, to affect change. Um, but, yeah, you know, I'm, I will not be the first one to bow out if uh, if more minutes are offered. But at the same time, I'm, I'm here to I'm here to help the team as as best that I can. So, yeah, it's a new role, but I'm enjoying it. Um, and I go back to where I started. It, it's less physically exhausting. <laughs> Don't break what's not broken. So no. it, 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 right. So now I, I want to finish off with these with these final three uh, three questions here. So um, the biggest part here, obviously, family over everything. And your brother, uh, your brother, your twin brother Ben, got his first start in nearly two and a half years um, because of, or actually even longer, nearly probably about three years. Uh, and the biggest reason was because of injuries and whatnot. Uh, and to see your brother wear that armband and not only to be coaching aside you, uh, to be with you in terms of, you know, a part of the FA Euro organization, what does that mean to you? And then how good was it to see him on the pitch wearing that armband and playing all 90 minutes as well? You were playing with him for a good chunk of minutes as well. Yeah. Uh, on Saturday. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, FA Euro is a family in so many definitions of the word, um, and and this is one that I'm lucky to to have a connect a familial connection uh, to. Playing with Ben is incredible. Training with Ben is incredible, um, and and really just seeing him overcome injury problems for a number of years and have a season where he's relatively healthy, uh, and and you know he can show what he can do and get the opportunity to play. It, it really is. Um, it's more, there's no one else I would rather watch in the world. So, um, you know, there's, there's playing and there's watching, but really when I get to see him play and especially, like you said, being, uh, captaining the side and, um, leading them out, I, I uh, it affects me, you know, up here and in here somewhere. So it, it's something that, uh, that I, I will, whatever opportunities we have left to play together, it's, uh, it's something that I, I will cherish so yeah fantastic um i love it and i hope it continues and i hope his ben deserves credit ben is such a good player i i uh i say it all the time he, he he's um had really bad injury problems um including getting injured in 
originally kind of starting this whole string of, of injuries in the, uh, in, well, again, it was then the PDL, but in, in a USL game um, in New Jersey um, and he tore a ligament in his knee. And, and then each season it's been kind of a recurrence of something related to that. So I'm, I'm just crossing my fingers and so happy for him, hoping he stays healthy uh, and can continue with the momentum that he started uh, on, uh, on Saturday um, and that he gets to kind of live in the moment for a little bit and try not to worry so much about like what's going to happen next or if there's going to be an injury on the horizon. So, you know, that's that's my hope. I'm 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 his biggest fan. Um, I'm not afraid to admit that. Uh, but I also think that I'm right. And it looks as if that there was a little technical issue there. We do apologize there. But in in terms of your brother, you listen, it is beyond amazing to see what he has overcome. I remember seeing when he was when he was injured as well. Uh, he would be a constant, pl- you know, a, a consistent player as well on the or in the first 11 as well. And then eventually slowly made his way back. Uh, so really cool stuff there. And again, I'd love to continue seeing him on the pitch as well. You know, not being able to, uh, do that and being alongside me on camera. He definitely does not want to do that, but listen, I, oh, I hope that when <laughs> he, he does get that, back he, on, he enjoys it. He enjoys uh, I know it. I, that I know he does, but when he does get back on camera, I hope it is for different reasons. As yeah. you brought up, it's not as tiring to be on the pitch and just, you know, <laughs> relaxing and being on camera doing stuff. Uh, Adam, let's let's conclude here with this. So similar to what everyone is asked uh, right when they get into college, they ask favorite athlete, favorite food, nicknames, favorite sports memories. I'm going to ask you these three, and I'm going to start with what is your favorite sports memory up to date in your, as you call it, ancient life? <laughs> yeah, I, it, there's a lot of good memories. I'm really lucky, um, but I'll go back to – winning the New York state cup, uh, in 2001. So wow, you're I old. was 10. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm dating myself, but, uh, it was that experience has snowballed into this whole life for me. Um, we got to go represent the United States in uh, in basically the world cup for kids our age. We went to France and did that. Um, the state cup, which, uh, we actually, our 2009s played in the state cup final and, uh, and lost yesterday, but it was a, it was a great run and they did incredibly well, but it means a lot, especially in New York. Um, and Joe was my coach at the time. So all of this has kind of led up to where we are now. So that has to be my, uh, my greatest sportsman. We were in the paper, we were on, um, I forget who interviewed us, Al Roker for something. Um, but we, you know, for 10 year olds, that was like the end all and be all that was legit. We did. We did the whole thing. We went to Dan. We went to uh, to where does uh, going to Disney World? We went to Disney World in France. So we did the whole thing. It was it was amazing. It was great. See, usually and usually when you win the Super Bowl here for American football, you usually go to Disney World down in Florida. But for you, you won the State Cup. You couldn't do it stateside, so you go to France. I love Euro that. Disney. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the next question would be um, who, the person that you would like to meet the most because your life is far from over wow wow great question there are so many people um including people in my family that i've never met um, that i'd like to call back and (laughs) i've heard enough stories that i just love to sit with them um i'd be really interested to meet jesse marsh who's the coach uh now newly appointed of red bull leipzig um started with with new york red bull and then moved to Salzburg and now Red Bull Leipzig. He's the, I mean, Bob Bradley, there are some American coaches that were abroad um, previously, but he's the the one that has really, um, I think, opened doors for U.S. coaches to have some credibility. Um, and so I started by going to Red Bull's games and sitting as close to the bench as I could and trying to hear the information he was giving. And I just think it would be fascinating to talk to him. Um, He's, he's, uh, you know, fr- from a coaching idol standpoint, I think he's somebody that, that I rank incredibly highly and to ask him what it was like coming from growing up in the United States, being U S kind of based and almost bound in the sense that the, the, the moniker of the United States, uh, kind of soccer personality or soccer, um, expert is, is like a, a moniker with an asterisk. So 
um, I think it's something to, to be able to, you know, pick his brain. That would be, that would be pretty cool. So Jesse Marsh is who I'm going with on the spot or someone from my family that I haven't met. <laughs> <laughs> now we have to ask the final question being when soccer is not on your mind and you want to just do something completely different, whether it be something extremely lazy whether it be something else that is active or simply just doing something for your personal self. What are the hobbies that you do on your off time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not answering that. No, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a fair question. I, I do, I do some things. I, I like to cook. Um, I'm not great at it, but I find it relaxing. Um, I, when I was younger, probably less so, but now, you know, I don't, I don't mind like doing the cleanup and stuff. So, uh, I'm okay with that. Um, I like to see friends like anybody else. Um, I really like to go to the beach. Actually. I find it very relaxing. Um, it doesn't have to be a nice beach. I actually love the beach in, uh, in Brighton, um, in Brooklyn, kind of just off of Coney Island. Um, it's, uh, I I'll go there with my laptop and do some work sometimes. And, um, I just, I find the sound of the ocean and the waves, et cetera, very relaxing and the breeze. So, um, you know, that I'm, I'm not uh, a skydiver type. I, I don't go thrill seeking in my, in my spare time, but, um, definitely I'll cook a pasta. Uh, I love that. And I'll, uh, I'll go to the beach. Pure bliss. Love that from you, Adam. Love that. Simple so pleasures. ladies and <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, cannot thank uh, everyone enough for tuning in. Adam, thank you so much for taking some time out of your workday to come join us here on Extra Time Meet the Team. And we look forward to not only seeing you on Wednesday, but continuing the hard work that you put in every single day with the club. Thanks, Joey. Ladies and gentlemen, for one last time, forward Adam Marku, as well as Director of Youth operations at FA Euro. I'm Joey Jerzinka for all of us at Euro Youth Football Association, as well as the Asian Observer and the Blackjack Media Group. 